Okay, welcome back. This is lesson 13, the simple harmonic oscillator wrap up and free particle states. Really, I only have a couple of things to say about the simple harmonic oscillator. One of them is a, an application that I wanted you guys to be aware of. You're taking thermo right now, so you are familiar with the concept of a heat capacity. What I wanted to discuss was the heat capacity of a diatomic gas. In particular, over temperature ranges in which the uh, molecules begin vibrating so that the simple harmonic oscillator is the model that you'd use to to treat that vibration at least uh, a, as a first pass. The basic idea is that the uh, the probability of the molecule having any particular energy is proportional to the Boltzmann factor e to the minus energy divided by kT. Now, uh, it's convenient to define beta to be 1 over kT, and then you can rewrite this uh, using the, no the notation e to the minus energy times beta, therefore. And there's a function, it has a name, it's called the partition function. It's simply the sum of e to the minus energy divided by kT, or e to the minus energy times beta, for all of the states in the system. So every individual state would have a contribution to the sum. And uh, in the case of the simple harmonic oscillator in one dimension, of course, there are, uh, there's one state for each value of n, n would be from 0 to infinity. Now, uh, the expectation value of the energy is simply the energy of each state times the corresponding probability of that state being occupied added up for all the states. And uh, you can see that the 1 over z out in front here really just corresponds to a kind of normalization factor. But uh, it's also true that since uh, the exponential is e to the minus energy times beta, if you take the derivative with respect to beta, that brings down the energy. And that is just exactly what you'd need to do to get the expectation value of the energy. So it turns out the expectation value of energy is minus 1 over z times the beta derivative of the partition function. Or sometimes folks write this as the logarithmic derivative with respect to beta of the partition function. The heat capacity is the derivative of the expectation value of the energy with respect to temperature. So that's, uh, or it's uh, delta q over delta t. So the point is, if we know the partition function, we can calculate the expectation value of the energy and, and, and its temperature dependence. And from that, we can get the heat capacity. Of course, the heat capacity you can measure in the laboratory. So it's an interesting way to check to see if your concept of what energy states are available and what values the energy states have holds any water. Here's some data collected about the heat capacity of nitrogen gas, uh, diatomic nitrogen gas, as a function of temperature from the National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology, I think, it's NIST. Um, and uh, here is what it looks like if you model the nitrogen molecule as a simple harmonic oscillator. Notice that up to about 1500 Kelvin, uh, the model actually worked quite well. Higher than 1500 Kelvin, not so much. Uh, it turns out if you use a Morse potential rather than a simple harmonic oscillator potential, you get a much better fit to the data. The spectrum of the Morse potential it basically just adds an extra term, which has to do with the uh, the degree to well, it has to do with like the dissociation energy and so on of the Morse potential. But my main point here is that uh, the simple harmonic oscillator works good over a fairly large temperature range. The Morse potential improves upon that, but that for many purposes at many at a fairly wide range of temperatures, you do pretty well just using the uh, plain old simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, let's talk about coherent states of the simple harmonic oscillator. Coherent states are basically minimum uncertainty superposition states. So what that means is uh, you start with a uh, a simple harmonic oscillator potential, and you imagine the ground state, which is a minimum uncertainty state, and you sort of translate the ground state over a little bit 
it turns out that uh, that is a super, you can build that, that translated version of the ground state. You can treat that as a superposition of different n, different energy eigenstates. Um, and when you work it out, the coefficients happen to be uh, some number to the nth power divided by the square root of n factorial. And uh, that's the coefficient of the nth state. In order to normalize that, it turns out the factor out in front has to be e to the minus alpha squared over 2. Alpha is some number that characterizes the, uh, characterizes the amount of displacement that you put in. Um, we'll see in a little bit exactly how that comes about and how it works. But, uh, but for the moment, let's look at a real quick Python demo to see this sort of in action. Okay, I just wanted to go through a little bit of the program for Project 4 in case you're struggling with it. Uh, in this case, we have 80 arrows and the length of the x-axis is 15. Um, HS is the Hermit polynomials. It's an array of arrays, sort of like the example I did in class the other day where I made an array of arrays of the uh, stationary states of the infinite square well. Also, I have an array of coefficients. These are going to be the they're like Fourier coefficients, but now they're Hermit polynomial coefficients to create the coherent state. That's the alpha to the 2n divided by square root of n factorial, or alpha to the n divided by square root of n factorial business. And of course, then there's the, uh, the actual wave functions. Now I have an array of array of wave functions. Now the wave functions are built up as uh, Hermit polynomials times Gaussians. And so we'll see how that works. I want to create the Hermit polynomials. I'm going to do that using a recursion relation that I described in an earlier video. We start with uh, HS0 is just 1, HS1 is 2 times x, and the higher order polynomials we get by taking twice x times the nth polynomial minus 2n times the n minus 1th polynomial that gives us the n plus one polynomial, and that should uh, that should take care of us. So that fills in the HS array with the Hermit polynomials. Then what I'm going to do is calculate the coefficients. I want to do that recursively because factorials are are uh, dangerous to do because they get very large. And it turns out that since these coefficients have factorials in them, we could easily overflow. But if we compute them recursively, then we reduce the risk of of overflow. Finally, I can calculate the uh, the wave functions. Uh, notice that I I start out um, the ground state size sub zero is just a Gaussian. Then I calculate the normalization factor that goes out in front, and then for the ith stationary state, I take the normalization factor times the ith Hermit polynomial times the Gaussian. And then I get all of the uh, wave functions. Then to make the superposition state, this is a single wave function, which is a superposition of the stationary states. Uh, I start out with an empty array of zeros. Then we're going to go through each of the terms in the sum, take the coefficient for the coherent state times the mth uh, stationary state and that makes my coherent state and that's all there is to it. Then I'll build the arrows and uh, and that's where your part begins. I'm not gonna uh, show you the whole program because that's partly up to you to program it but uh, let's go ahead and look at how the thing behaves if I move my windows down here so you can see them. I'll do it this way. Hang on. Okay here we go. There's the wave function showing up and here is the time dependence and we'll go ahead and click and you can see that the uh, the time dependence of the expectation value of position so here's the expectation value of position and you can see the thing wiggles and there's the wave function wiggling back and forth and uh, that is how the stationary state actually or not the stationary state, the coherent state actually evolves in time. And that's the point of your program, is to compute that. Very exciting.
Uh, all right, so back to the slides. Okay, let's look at coherent states and the way they depend on time. So uh, the idea is we've got our coherent state, the same one we started with before, but now we're going to turn on the time. What happens? Well, just like with any other quantum system, if you've expanded it in terms of energy eigenstates, each energy eigenstate just advances in phase at a rate that's determined by the energy of that state. In other words, each energy eigenstate gets multiplied by the time-dependent phase factor e to the minus i omega sub nt. It's that simple. What if we want to compute something like, uh, like the expectation value of x as a function of time? Well, it's the same plan that we've used before, except now the state psi of t is an infinite sum of stationary states, each with its own time factor. But we can form the corresponding bra by taking the complex conjugate of the coefficients and writing the bra of each of the kets. And then, of course, x is pr produced. The x operator is nothing other than a sum of a raising and a lowering operator, just like we did in the chapter on simple harmonic motion. I've got that all expressed at the bottom there. I want you to notice I took the e to the minus alpha squared over 2 out in front for each of the terms, each of the uh, psi functions. There's the bra and the ket. And I've replaced the x operator with the uh, a plus plus a minus uh, times the oscillator length divided by the square root of 2. That's our old friend. And uh, let's see what happens when we grind on this a little bit. It looks hideous, of course, but it's not that bad. Uh, you simply have to march ahead. I'll go ahead and move the sum symbols to the left and uh, shuffle some stuff around. I want you to notice there's a factor e to the plus i omega sub mt from the bra. There's an e to the minus i omega sub nt from the ket. And, uh, and we have an one raising and one lowering operator in the middle. If you think about that a little bit, you'll realize that when you hit n with a plus, you get n plus 1. But m on n plus 1 is a inner product that's only going to be non-zero when m is equal to n plus 1. And similarly, when a minus acts on n, you get n minus 1, and when you in take the inner product of that with the mth state, with the mth bra, you're going to get a term that's only non-zero when m is equal to n minus 1. So, uh, of course, when m is equal to n minus 1, e to the i omega m minus omega nt is e to the minus i omega t. And uh, when m is equal to n plus 1, I'm sorry, when m is equal to, yeah, that's right, m is equal to n plus 1, omega sub m minus omega sub n will be e to the plus i omega t. Remember the difference between neighboring energy levels in the simple harmonic oscillator is h bar omega, the natural frequency of the oscillator. So the difference between corresponding omegas is just the natural frequency of the oscillator. So when I plug all that in, put in the square root of n plus 1 and the square root of n factor from the raising and lowering operator, and put in the fact that omega sub n plus 1 minus omega sub n is omega, I get the following expression. Now one thing to notice, remember n starts at 0, so the expression on the right hand side of the parentheses is 0 for the first term. The one on the left hand side is not. So I can throw away that first term on the right. Actually I might as well just change all those n's to n plus 1's and then every term will count. If I do that, uh, you notice that uh, what I'm going to have then is an extra factor of alpha out in front and the alpha the 2n minus 1 becomes alpha 2n plus 1 and I can factor out that alpha. The square root of n over n minus 1 um, let's see that all turns out to give me a square root of n plus 1 divided by the square root of n times the square root of n plus 1. So the two terms, the left term and the right term, actually look identical, except one has an e to the plus i omega t, and one has e to the minus i omega t. So what I can do is factor the identical parts out, 
and I'm left with a term in parentheses that has no n in it at all, uh, but that's simply twice the cosine of omega t. So I can factor the twice cosine omega t out, and you have the sum alpha to the 2n over n factorial. But uh, if you know your sums, you know that that's nothing other than e to the plus alpha squared. So that whole sum there is nothing but e to the plus alpha squared. On the left-hand side, I have e to the minus alpha squared. And so those two guys cancel. And what I'm left with is an expectation value of position that's proportional to alpha, but it also it goes like cosine omega t, where omega is the natural frequency of the oscillator. And of course, it's got the oscillator length in it. So what I have is a, uh, an expectation value of position that oscillates with the natural frequency of the oscillator with an amplitude that's proportional to alpha. It's basically roughly alpha times the oscillator length. There's a square root of 2 in there as well. So now we understand what's going on. Basically I have a, uh, a wave packet that's oscillating back and forth and it's, uh, it's got an amplitude that's proportional to alpha. Of course that means the energy goes something like alpha squared and uh, of course we know that alpha squared is actually the expectation value of n, the uh, eigenvalue, the n, the energy uh, eigenvalue of the uh, of the oscillator. So, too much fun. I hope uh, maybe that gives you some idea of how you can do calculations with these guys. Uh, when it comes time to do the questions at the end of the report, maybe that will help you out a little bit. All right, let's talk about the Poisson distribution. It turns out that the probability of having uh, n, an energy of n, I guess, or a quantum number of n in the coherent state turns out to be nothing other than the Poisson distribution. It's a standard distribution that was well known before quantum mechanics was invented, so it has nothing directly to do with quantum mechanics exactly. But uh, it is important to know a little bit about how you do calculations with the Poisson distribution. Let's take an example. What if I want to know the expectation value of n in the Poisson distribution? Notice that I can uh, plug in the definition of the Poisson distribution. Notice that I have an n over n factorial. That gives me uh, an n over n times n minus 1 factorial. And uh, I can factor out a mu. I can get rid of the n over n because that's just 1. And also notice that in the expectation value sum, the first term doesn't count. So I can go back and replace all of the n minus 1s with n, and it won't change the sum because the first term doesn't do anything anyway. And you'll notice that I have then e to the minus mu times mu times uh, the sum of mu to the n over n factorial. But what is the sum of mu to the n over n factorial? Well, that's e to the mu. So e to the mu times e to the minus mu gives me 1, and I get the expectation value of n is mu. So that's kind of a trick you can use to evaluate uh, different moments of the Poisson distribution. You can play games like this. If you work out the same idea for the expectation value of n squared, it turns out it's mu squared plus mu. Okay, so if you calculate the difference between n squared, the expectation value of n squared, and the expectation value of n, squared, you've got the variance. You can see that that's going to turn out to be just mu. And that means the square root of the variance, or the deviation, is the square root of mu. So both the expectation value of n and its variance are equal to mu, and that means that this is a one-parameter distribution. Anyway, I hope that helps you guys with your answers to Computing Project 4 questions and uh, gives you some sense of how you do calculations using the Poisson distribution. Uh, free particle states are pretty easy. We've actually already dealt with them when we did the traveling wave in Computing Project 2 um, because the Schrodinger equation when the potential is equal to zero is simply that the second derivative of the wave function is minus a constant times the wave function. The constant turns out to be k squared and the solutions turn out to be traveling waves moving to the right or the left. The, uh, the energy 
that corresponds to a particular value of k is just the kinetic energy. It's the momentum squared divided by 2m. That's h bar k squared divided by 2m. So that's pretty easy. Uh, a couple of things that are different with the k in the free particle state as opposed to the infinite square well is that the k is no longer quantized. There are no boundary conditions for a free particle, so there's no requirement that the wave function go to zero at any particular place, and so that means that uh, k can be anything. The other problem is that these wave functions that I've got written here, you can't normalize. So they're not really proper wave functions in the sense that they correspond to realistic situations, but they are important as a sort of a mathematical model of what could be going on. Here's a way to get a handle on how to deal with these wave functions in a real uh, example, a real case. Suppose we start out with the infinite square well, and then we let the infinite square well stretch to a large size. We let the size of the well become very, very great. What's going to happen? Well, the k values that are allowed, if you do that, if you let a become large, what's going to happen is the k values are going to get more and more closely spaced together. Also, the boundaries become very far away, and so what that means is we don't any longer have to use sines and cosines because the reason we use sines, for example, was because we had our well go from 0 to a and we needed the wave function to go to 0 at the boundaries, but the boundaries are going off to infinity now, so that means that we don't really have to worry about the boundary conditions um, because the boundaries are in infinity. So we can use li left or right, right traveling waves, the same kind we used in project two, uh, where k can be a positive number or a negative number. It can have any value. Uh, those all correspond to solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Um, but uh, so what's good about that? What we have to do in order to form realistic solutions is to use superpositions of these infinitely um, dis distributed, I guess, traveling waves. And so what we want to do is to write a general solution as the sum of multiple different traveling waves with different values of k. So in a very large but not quite infinite square well, the values of k will be, uh, the allowed values of k will be finite or incountably infinite, I guess they'll be countably infinite, but the spacing between them is going to become very, very tiny as we let the well grow in size. And so it's going to produce a series of uh, k's that are very, very close together. In the limit as the well goes to infinite size, we're going to get a continuous distribution of k's. And this sum, the superposition sum, is going to have to evolve into an integral. Okay? But now the coefficients are not countable anymore, so we need a function. When you have uh, so many coefficients you can't count them, you need to describe a function which says what the coefficient is as a function of k. So the thing ends up looking something like this. Um, in practice, or I guess should say, the convention is that we define the coefficient function as phi of k, and we throw out in front a normalization factor, 1 over the square root of 2 pi, in order that you can run back and forth between the function of k and the function of x. It turns out that all the information that was in psi of x is also in phi of k. All the information in phi of k is also in psi of x. So phi of k sort of becomes a new way to view the wave function. It's called the momentum space wave function, or the k-space wave function. It's uh, just a different way to look at the same wave function. If you've done uh, electrical engineering, this is no different from time domain and frequency domain functions, which uh, basically do exactly the same thing. The uh, superposition state is psi. The Fourier coefficient function is phi. It's also called the Fourier transform of psi. And uh, we're going to learn in chapter 3 that this is actually just a special case of a very general concept called a change of basis. And um, the phi function in this particular 
example sort of plays the role of the Fourier coefficients in a Fourier series. It's just that the frequencies are now continuously distributed instead of discrete. And so we calculate the phi of k's using what's called a Fourier transform. And we calculate psi using what's called the inverse Fourier transform. And, uh, and that's how those guys work. OK. Now, there are also discrete versions of the same thing, the discrete Fourier transform. And uh, we'll get used to these functions and see how they work. But I just want to put them out there for you. They're also in the write-up for Project 5. So you'll get a chance to play with these. The only reason I really put these there for now is that uh, when you compute Fourier transforms on the computer, the computer actually computes the discrete Fourier transform. So it's uh, slightly different factors and slightly different nomenclature, but it's basically the same idea. We're going to derive both of these forms, the discrete form and the continuous form, when we get to chapter 3. And uh, But for right now, we're just going to get used to what they do and how the machinery works. But we're not going to worry too much about exactly how you derive them yet, but give it time. Finally, what happens if you turn on the time? What happens is um, each energy eigenstate gets multiplied by a phase factor that's whose frequency is determined by the state's energy. It's the same old plan we've done before, and, uh, and that's the whole thing. So to calculate psi of x and t, it's just like the inverse Fourier transform, except now, instead of just e to the i k x, we have e to the i k x minus omega k t. In other words, each term in the sum, each term in the integral, I guess, is getting multiplied by the corresponding phase factor. And it works exactly the same way for the um, discrete Fourier transform. Each term gets multiplied by e to the minus i omega k t. And uh, in fact, you could use each of these forms to define what you mean by the inverse Fourier transform uh, in its conventional sense without the time part by just setting the time to zero. You get back the regular old inverse Fourier transform. All right, so that's all there is to it. I hope, uh, I hope it wasn't too crazy, and we'll see you guys next time.